Our Bible study today is on 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse 14. Let us pray. Lord, as the people of uh, Corinth long ago learned from Paul uh, that we cannot worship at two different altars, that we cannot uh, have um, as our God both mammon and you, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to realize that the there are all kinds of idols in our world that try to take hold of our allegiance, and we pray that through the power of your Spirit, we would uh, submit to you alone, and that we would turn our backs on the things of this world, and you would help us to, uh, to walk in the ways of righteousness for the glory of your name and for the blessing of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so one of the things that we talked about when we first started in the book of Corinthians First Corinthians was how Paul uh, was addressing certain, you know, abuses, and it talked about how you know he says there's something that's am among you that even the pagans don't uh, put up with, and that was that there was a, it said a man has his father's wife. So obviously it wasn't his mother, but it was most likely a guy having a, an affair with his stepmother. Like maybe his father died and his stepmother was still alive, and then they, you know, or maybe you know even worse, maybe they, uh, you know, he had an adulterous affair with his stepmother, you know, we, we don't know. Um, but he says, you know, this, such things should not happen. This is, uh, in a, this is um, a horrible example to the world. It, it, it shows that there's like a cancer inside the body of Christ, the church, and that this cancer is going to, it's going to destroy the church and it's going to cause shame to, the, to Jesus Christ. So he, he mentions that earlier on. And then he gets to the idol feasts at the Lord's Supper. And so he's um, going to be covering similar topics. In verse, uh, well, chapter 10, he had, he had talked about the warnings from Israel's history about how even the people of Israel were not spared when they sinned. So, you know, I guess that's a, that's a warning for the Corinthian church as, as well as all churches, that God doesn't stand for sin in the midst of his people, that we're, we are to be a holy people even as God is a holy God. And, uh, and that's the theme of the book of Leviticus. You know, God says, I, the Lord your God, am holy, and you must be holy. And that is a command, but it's also a promise, because, you know, as, if realizing what the law says in the Old Testament, the law, the, God didn't give us the law to say, now follow these and you'll go to heaven, because he knew we were sinners. So when God commands us to be holy, sure, he's saying this is God's expectation, but he also, it's a promise, because he's the one who has the solution for sin, and that is faith in a savior. So the preparation for the savior was already in the Old Testament. And by the time you get to the New Testament, we see the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. Okay, so the, the warnings from Israel's history is, is really a type of law, right? The law is to say, you know, if you disobey, you will surely die. And then an example of these people from the history of Israel who died for dis, disobeying God. So we want to realize that we don't want to walk down the path of death because that, that's, uh, you know, dangerous for us um, spiritually. And, and yet, even as saved believers, the, the temptations are there. And, and especially for the Corinthians, just imagine, these are people who grew up in a pagan culture, the whole city. You know, Corinth is kind of like Las Vegas, right? So it was like the Las Vegas of its day. There was people who were living wild lifestyles. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a temple to Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and, and there's, um, you know, ri uh, writings from other authors like Josephus, who was a hist historian, a Jewish historian in the Roman Empire, and he talked about how the um, priestesses, who were at, in essence prostitutes, would come down from the, every evening from the temple, which was on the highest hill in the city, and come down through the streets, walking through, singing, and inviting men to come back to the temple to worship with them. But it wasn't really worship, it was, you know, a cult prostitution. Okay, so that's the idolatry. We're not just talking about like, oh, bowing down to a piece of wood. We're talking about, you know, participating in the hedonism of the time, which people today do, but they don't call it idol worship. They call it, you know, parting. Okay, so starting at verse 14. They call it yeah, yeah. It's they call new. it, right. Yeah, it's not new. It's, it's, they've been around for a long time. Yeah. Okay, so in verse 14, uh, Paul says, therefore, my dear friends. So he's saying therefore, because he's, He's um, saying every, all these examples about people in the past, in the, especially the Old Testament, who had um, you know, been tempted to, to disobey God and did it. That was a, a dangerous thing because they were punished. 
And, he, and so he says, therefore, so based on all these things that you've already heard, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? Okay, so the word, there, the word for thanksgiving in Greek is the word Eucharist, right? Have you heard that word before? Because that's actually one of the names for communion. So he's talking here about the cup of thanksgiving is the Eucharist, is holy communion. When we participate in, and that's actually, again, the word participation there is the word koinonia, which is the Greek word that's sometimes translated as communion. So in essence, you're saying the Eucharist for which we give thanks, isn't that a communion or a participation in the blood of Christ? So when you're taking communion, we are participating or taking uh, we're receiving the benefits, we're interacting, we're becoming one with Jesus. It's Jesus giving of himself and we giving ourselves to Jesus. Okay, so now he's going to say, okay, if you're becoming one with Jesus, think about who you are and what you're bringing to the altar. Because that's what the point is here, his argument. Is it, uh, so he says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? So in Greek, when you ever ask a question, inherent in the question is the uh, implied answer. So if you wanted someone to say, of course, then there was a way of saying that. And if you wanted the answer to be, of course not, then you would say that as well. Hello. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we're talking here about, the, um, about Holy Communion uh, from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So uh, Paul was, uh, is talking about how it, when you participate, uh, in the cup of thanksgiving is this is not a participation in the blood of Christ and so the way that he asks the question he's expecting the answer to be of course okay so this is the second half of verse 16 and is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ and of course the answer then uh, the, um, imp the expected answer is of course could you get the door please thanks uh, so, both of those questions of are the, the answer is of course, you know. So we know that uh, when we go to communion, that this is not. I mean, according to the way he's describing it here, he's not saying it's participation in just the bread and the wine or the cup of wine. That is, he's saying it's participation in the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. And the word again, the word participation is the word fellowship or communion. So we're having communion. We're participating with Jesus. And he says, verse 17, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of, one, of the one loaf. So within the Holy Communion, there's kind of like a, uh, a mystery. It's like, you know, a loaf of bread is made out of, you know, hundreds and maybe thousands of kernels of wheat, right? They're crushed, they're mixed, they're baked together, they become one. So... Uh, and the same thing is true with like grape with grape juice and wine. You know, you take thousands of grapes, you crush them, they become one cup, one liquid, one thing that you can partake of. So the many become one. So this is that in a way the the bread and the wine are symbolic of how God's people, who are many, become one by participating in communion. Uh, but it's also a picture of Jesus because it tells us that the church is not just a bunch of people. It is called the body of Christ. And it, he's actually mentioned that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which we haven't gotten to yet. So the body of Christ is, is, the, um, is kind of like the, this is the reality of what the church is. And then the blueprint of the church is really something what we see on earth. It's kind of like you know, how Jesus talked about in John chapter 2 about the temple. Remember, he, they're walking past the temple in Jerusalem, and the, the, the disciples say, look at these wonderful buildings. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Uh, tear down this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it. And they're all, it took 40 years to build this. Who's gonna, who could tear it down in three days? And what, why would you, how can you rebuild it? You're just one person. And so Jesus says, was not talking about the the physical temple, but he's talking about the spiritual temple, which is his body. He is the real temple. But not even just spiritual, because a better way of talking about it is, is there's the type and the anti-type. And that's kind of a way of talking prophetically in the Bible. So think about like the Exodus is a, is a type, and the anti-type is Jesus dying on the cross. 
Because the Passover lamb died and the angel of death passed over. But in Jesus' death on the cross, he's our Passover lamb, which it says in the book of Hebrews. Then the angel of death passes over us, so we no longer die, but have eternal life. Jesus said in John 11, whoever believes in me, even though he dies, yet he shall live. So the, the type and the antitype are the, um, the earthly symbol and then the reality in heaven. So Jesus is really kind of saying that in communion, we're taking the bread and the body, but Jesus is the reality. The church is, is kind of the type or the symbol on earth, but the reality of what the church is, is really seen in Jesus. It's kind of like the difference between like a building and a blueprint. You can look at a blueprint all you want. You can't live in it, no. right? It's just, it's just a blueprint. So it's not the reality of the thing itself. It just points to the thing itself. So in a way, the church on earth is like the blueprint because despite the fact that you and I are the body of Christ, we're still sinful, we're still broken, and we're still in a world that's fading away. It's, and, and this is not the reality. The reality will be in heaven. So the body of Christ will be in its glory. It'll be its fullest in heaven. So the earthly church is the type, the heavenly church, which is the body of Christ. Jesus will be the head. It says Jesus is the head, and all of us are the limbs. And, you know, some limbs are, do some things and some do other. And we, ha we all need each other, right? And some of the ones that are the, the least seen are sometimes the most important. You know, I've never seen a person's heart, literally. Mm -hmm. But without it, they'd be dead. So there's some parts of our body that are unseen that keep the thing going. And so, in a way, think about the church. There's people within churches that keep things going. They, they're sharing the gospel. They're loving each other. They're lifting each other up in prayer and encouraging each other. Then no one knows who they are, but they're doing it. And those are the parts of the, of the body that are kind of unseen but are very important. And God provides those things. So, so he's, he's just starting to talk about this. I mean, he's going to get more into that in chapter 12. Yeah. In what sense uh, could you explain the, uh, how the church is in heaven? No, I'm saying I when... I see the church is on earth. No, no, I meant when, when we uh, go to heaven, that that's when we'll be, the, or the church, earthly church will be purged of sin and will be in, it, in the way it was meant to be. Okay. So, so that's what I meant. They're not simultaneous. There isn't something... In the well, heaven, like in a way... Now. Uh, it's simultaneous because think about all who have died in the faith, they are in the presence of the Lord. Yeah. So in a way, they're and they're waiting for the rest of us to join them. So it's incomplete. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's incomplete. Yeah. Maybe it's part of that. I. So I, you know, maybe I was pushing the metaphor too far. But the idea that the earthly church is is a type, but Christ is the ultimate. You know, it talks about the body of Christ. Jesus is who we. Um, are trying to model ourselves after, right? No matter how good we try to be, we'll never be perfect like Jesus until we're in heaven. Because Jesus does say, when Revelation 21, which says, when we come into heaven, he says, uh, he will embrace us and he will wipe away every tear from our eye and there will be no longer any death or illness for all these things shall pass away. So in heaven, we'll have an, a glorified body that will no longer sin, grow old, get sick or die. So I, I guess that's the thing, is the earthly uh, church is still uh, in, in a corrupted sense, but Jesus doesn't treat us like that. He treats us the way we'll be in heaven. He treats us as the bride, and, and in essence, the bride is preparing herself to come to the bridegroom's home. And that's what it was in the Old Testament. In the, in the Jewish um, period, they would uh, the, the bride prepared herself for the time when the groom would come back and bring her home. And that's why we talk about Jesus' second return. He's coming back here to bring his bride home, the, the bride of Christ, which is the church. That's us. So we're looking forward to that time he will bring us home. So in that preparation time, we, we are to prepare ourselves. I mean, a bride getting ready for a wedding is not like, you know, she's not like not washing and, you know, and wearing old clothes. No, she's... She's pampering herself. She's getting ready for the wedding day. Are we getting ready for the wedding day? Wedding day. The wedding day is when we enter into heaven. You know, it talks about how that when we're in heaven, what do we do? It is called the marriage feast of the Lamb in His kingdom, and it describes the heaven. Is Jesus gives a bunch of um, a bunch of parables about heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast. And then he goes on to describe what it's like. And, you know, one of the descriptions was, like, there's a man who comes into the wedding feast, and he's not wearing wedding clothes. Because, you know, when you got invited, 
the, the person who invited you had to provide the wedding clothes for you because it was a poor society. That's right. So, you know, it'd be kind of like how a bride often maybe helps uh, her bridesmaids by giving them bridesmaids' dresses or at least gives them direction on what she wants them to wear. And, you know, maybe the groom rents the tuxes for, the, his, uh, for his men, and the groomsmen. And so in the ancient world, you provided clothing bride, uh, wedding clothing for all the people who came because it was a week-long affair and you wore something nice and the, and the people who invited you uh, provided that. So in the parable, there was a guy who got into the wedding feast and he wasn't wearing wedding clothes and, and the, the father of the groom, which is in essence is like a picture of God, the father, and then the, Jesus is the groom. <coughs> he says, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And he throws them out into the darkness where there was... Um, where there was crying and gnashing of teeth. And that's a picture of heaven. Outside of heaven, uh, I mean, sorry, that's a, a picture of hell. Outside of heaven is hell, yeah. And heaven is the wedding feast. Hell is outside of the wedding feast. Because there's only two places. You're either in God's presence or you're not. If you're outside of God's presence, you are in a place that is where it's darkness and gnashing of teeth. Mm -hmm. Now, the part I like is, um, maybe that even more, but I like the one where it says you'll be caught up because I want to be caught up in the change yeah. of the twinkle of the eye. Right. So. Well, uh, in, that's in 2 Thessalonians. I think it's chapter 4. And the word there, caught up, is the word um, in Latin, it's, it's translated rapture, but in the Greek, it doesn't actually, it, it doesn't have that same meaning. The Latin word for rapture has a, a slightly different meaning than the Greek word, which just means to be caught up. Mm -hmm. And so the description there is that when Jesus returns, that it says every eye will see him. There will be a loud trumpet blast. And so we know that this is a public thing. Jesus will not secretly return. He will come in glory. And, and in essence, it's similar to what he, Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 and 25. He talked about that when the Son of Man returns, the, all people will be separated, the sheep from the goats, and, and Jesus will confront us. So it's, and it says the dead in Christ will rise first, and then the rest of us will be caught up in the air. Yeah. My, my wife was excited because there's a movie coming out called Left Behind yeah. which kind of deals with in some fashion and I don't know whether it's good theology or not probably <coughs> not but about that whole issue of right. being left behind and the and the rapture and so on and so forth. Yeah, in, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this um, Bible study, but just simply, I would say that, uh, that um, there's a, uh, a group of Christians called uh, dispensational premillennialists. And so a premillennialist is a person who says that, that Jesus will return before, pre, before the thousand year reign that he'll set up. And so, um, and, and, and they, they believe that Jesus will actually when we talk about the rapture, he'll take people out of this world into heaven while the rest of the world will be left behind. And then, you know, people will be kind of fighting it out and killing each other until there might be some mass conversions. But they combine that passage from Second Thessalonians with the passage from Matthew where it talks about two are working in a field, one is left and the other one is taken. But it, that passage does not say anything about uh, the second return of Christ. It doesn't... It, it, the context has nothing to do. Most likely, that passage is a passage about judgment, right? But it doesn't actually tell us which person is judged. Is the person taken the one who's judged, or is the person left behind judged? It doesn't describe. And so they're making some assumptions by taking the passage from Matthew and 2 Thessalonians and putting those together and saying, oh, Jesus will return and will be caught up, and then some will be left behind. And the left behind people are going to, be, that'll be the tribulation, and that'll be horrible. And uh, I, I don't agree with that theology because I think that that's pushing uh, it's taking some stuff out of context and, and I think there's other passages in scripture that support a, um, a different view that Jesus returns once instead of twice because really the premillennialists say that Jesus returns twice. The first time he, he returns secretly, the second time he, he returns and he'll set up an earthly kingdom in Jerusalem for a thousand years and I don't see how there's anything in the Bible that supports Jesus supporting an earthly kingdom. Because remember when and Pontius Pilate was um, interviewing Jesus, he said, he said, so you are a king. And he says, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. So why would he come back and set up a kingdom on this world when he said, my kingdom is not of this world? Mm -hmm. So I think that when Jesus returns, that's the end. You know, and it's the judgment. And Jesus tell, told us what the, would happen when he returned in Matthew 25. The sheep and the goats will be separated. To me, that's so easy to understand. I don't understand why the uh, Kingdom Hall witnesses don't understand that. Because they think yeah. it's going to be here on right. the earth. 
Well, you know, you, you got to realize that there's kind of a history of theology and the uh, dispensational movement uh, started with Schofield, who wrote, uh, he wrote a reference Bible back in the 1800s. And the Schofield Reference Bible, which is still in print today, is the main source of the premillennial dispensational theology. See, the word dispensation is, means epics. So they believe that there's different epics in the world's history, that God treated everybody in the pre-Noah epic uh, you know, with punishment. And then after that, God had an epic of grace, a dispensation of grace. And then there was the, when God called the Jewish people, Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, that was the new epic of the Jewish faith. And, then, and so he, he, they talk about how God treats people in a, specifically in each of these epics. And now after the Pentecost event in Acts 2, we're in the epic of or the dispensation of the church time. And so, but they still think that this theology says the Jewish people are different. They're in a different epic. They're treated differently, and God treats the church differently. But that's like saying the Jewish people can go to heaven because of their obedience of the law, and then the Christians go to heaven because we have our faith in Jesus. But Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So how can the Jewish people get to heaven if they don't believe in Jesus as their Savior? So there is a false teaching in the dispensational ideas of Schofield that were in his reference Bible that were the basis for this premillennial th theology that you find in most non-denominational churches. And, and the thing is interesting about this is that the majority of Christians in the world do not actually believe this or accept this. It's only in America and Canada that's the majority of Christians that have this premillennial view. So, and, so for, and it only came around in the 1800s. So you think about before, in the first 1800s years of Christianity, nobody had this premillennial view. There may be some traces of people in the early church, but they were never supported. It wasn't, and then and then around the world, you know, the Catholics don't believe it, the Lutherans don't believe it, the Anglicans, the Episcopals, you know, there's lots of people who don't believe it. But people who came out of Calvinist Protestantism and specifically Adventism, and there was a movement of uh, people in the 1800s, you know, that started to um, teach us. Yeah, right, right, Millerites. And you know what's interesting is that is that some of the false teachings of uh, of our of our day came from that movement because there was people who were trying to predict the end of the world. When was Jesus coming? Well, the Millerites ended up becoming the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Jehovah's Witnesses said, "Oh, Jesus is coming in like 1914," and he didn't show up. And then they said, "Oh, we missed it," and they refigured their dates. They looked in the Bible and they said, "Oh, he's coming in." And uh, the end of 1914 in October, and he did, still didn't come. And then they said, oh, well, Jesus did come, but he came secretly, and you just didn't see it. And so then the true believers stayed with the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the rest of them fell out. So then, you know, so you have a cult starting with a false interpretation, because doesn't, doesn't Jesus say, remember when they asked him, well, when are you going to return? He says, he says, I, neither, he says um, nobody knows the day, not even the sun. So in Jesus' earthly presence on earth, he never, he himself did not have that knowledge. Not because he couldn't have it, because he did, he submitted to the Father's will and refused to have it. He let the Father be the timetable, and he submitted and says, I, I don't know. That's not for me to tell you. You're going to have to wait, because then what you have to do is you have to have faith, because if you know the day, then you might do a bunch of other things, right? You might say, well, if Jesus is coming like a week from now, I like to party until he gets here. <laughs> you know, then, I'll, then I'll repent. And stay ready. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you don't know what day. So yeah. So it's be it's better yeah, exactly because then we're then we're ready every day. So when you're when a person never been a Christian and they fall down sick in the hospital and they're about to leave this world, uh, is it possible that they can quote uh, Romans nine what is it, nine and ten and say uh, they believe in Jesus Christ and want Christ to come in their life? Well, if they ask somebody, if they ask Jesus to be their savior and to save them, whoever um, calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Mm -hmm. So I believe that there are such things as deathbed confessions, and a person can be can repent. Repent. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that the longer you've lived your life hardening your heart, because I mean, there's a difference between like not knowing Jesus and being hardened against Him. Mm -hmm. So, because I I've met some people um, who didn't know Jesus, mm -hmm. and it wasn't because they didn't like Him, mm -hmm. or that they rejected Him. Mm -hmm. They just weren't a family that never went to church. They didn't know anything about this church thing. And then all of a sudden they met some Christians and they're all, oh man, there's something that I've been searching my whole life for and, I, and this is it. So I met this young man who told me that when he found out about Jesus and he joined this Lutheran church where my parents go to in Garden Grove, he was just, it, was a, it turned his life around. And nobody in his family is a Christian, just him. 
And you know, he never lear- learned anything about Jesus, and he didn't know any, it, He didn't have any reason to hate Christians. Mm-hmm. He just didn't know anything because it just is. It's just the way he was raised. Yeah, his parents just never told him because they didn't go to church. Yeah. So there are people who could come to faith because maybe they were introduced to Jesus. Mm-hmm. But then let's say you were introduced to Jesus during your lifetime, but then you rejected him. Then you've hardened your heart and it becomes harder to, to you know, it's like well, there's like two roads. You walk the road of death and the road of life, and, the, and they, they, there's a fork in the road. They keep, they keep diverging. Mm-hmm. So the longer you walk down the path of death, a rejection of the Holy Spirit, the harder it is to ever get back on the... Because they separate. They go further apart. It's kind of like the Pharaoh in Egypt where you know, he hardened his heart yes. five times, and then the last five times it says, and then the Lord hardened his heart yeah. to keep him from uh, coming to faith because he was going to use him to, as a punishment and as an example and to show the glory of the Lord. That's the time Nora. Yeah. Nora, uh, he probably would have opened the door to the, the boat, but God closed it. Oh, right. And, yeah, that's right. Noah is the one who, um, he, he didn't have the power to seal himself in. It said the Lord sealed him in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyways, uh, so we've got a long uh, kind of tangent about um, the body of Christ. And he's talking really about how in communion we're participating with Jesus. Okay. So the argument is if, you're, if you become one with Jesus, then what happens if you're bringing some other sin with you to the altar? Because that's what he says in verse 18. Consider the people of Israel... Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? So he's talking about, you know, again, because this is before Christianity had really grown. So a lot of these Jewish people or people who came into Christianity knowing about Judaism said, oh yeah, the priests um, would go to the temple and they would participate in the sacrifices. And then he says in verse 19, do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, no. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to participate with demons. So he's saying that there is a reality. Um, in a way, for, for the Christian, idols are nothing. So that's why he was um, talking about that if you eat meat offered to idols, that it's not anything bad for you because idols are not, you know, they're worthless. Uh, because in, in the ancient world, the Roman world, there was no butcher shops that were Christian only. They were, they were all pagan. So if you wanted to buy meat, then somebody had already offered the, the animal in the temple as an offering to the gods, and then they butchered it and they brought it out to the, to the market, the meat market, and you bought it. So you might say, you know, if you were um, mature in your faith, you can say, well, that, I don't believe in idols, so it's no big deal for me. But a person who's weak in their faith, who had used to practice by going to the idols might say, I can't have, I could never eat meat offered idols. And if he sees you eating meat offered idols and you're hurting his faith. So we talked about that before. So, was there any meat that was not offered to idols? Yeah. Uh, if, you, uh, if you butchered it yourself, yeah, butchered it yourself. Yeah, but very few people, you know, even today, very few people butcher their meat themselves. Yeah. You know, farmers do, but even then. So for, is this almost a call to uh, vegetarianism? Mm, not necessarily. He's just saying because he, he said that meat offered to idols is not a problem unless it's a problem for your weaker neighbor. Okay, okay. Then you don't want to be a bad example. You don't do it in front of them. You don't. You don't need. There's no reason to hide it. You just don't want to offend people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so he says, you know, like again in verse 19, do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. Okay, so he's saying that the idol in itself is nothing. But why is there idol worship in the first place? Because there is a spiritual battle that's going on. In the book of Daniel, he talks about how, you know, you got the prince of Persia and, and whether or not he's going to let the Jewish people uh, go to um, Israel and rebuild the temple. And then, you know, how, like the book of Esther, it talks about how Haman talks the Xerxes into ca- uh, um, letting there be a day to kill all the Jewish people, right? So there's a there's something happening on earth, but it says that in the meantime, there was a demon who was fighting with the archangel Gabriel, to, and, and this was the, it calls him the prince of Persia, the demonic prince of Persia. Not the prince of Persia, but the, the demonic force that was leading Persia to become the instrument to exterminate the, the Jewish people. So there's a spiritual battle going on. So he's saying that when you go to a, a temple, a pagan temple, sure, the pagan idols are nothing but 
there is a spiritual battle going on at those places. That's why when if you go to eat eat in a uh, eat a sacrifice in a in a um, pagan temple, you are actually participating with demons. Okay, because he was just talking about how when you go to the altar of the Lord and you offer a sacrifice and you eat some of that sacrifice, you're participating with God and his benefits for you. He gives you forgiveness of sins. He blesses your life. He strengthens your faith. When you go to a temple of a demon, or I'm, I'm sorry, of a, of a pagan idol, what spiritual force is at work there? Well, he's telling us that it's, you're participating with demons. In verse 21, he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have both a part in the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the jealous, the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You know, it's talking, in this last part, he's saying, you know, God is a jealous God. And I know, I, I think the English word for jealous sometimes is seen as like a bad word. Like, you know, oh, you're jealous. What's wrong with you? Well, when it, the, a better translation for the word jealous is the word zealous. Zealous means passionate. And so, Think of it like this. God has every human characteristic that God portrays is righteous and, and uh, he, he, everything he does is good. So if God has any type of jealousy, it is a righteous jealousy. So what type of jealousy is righteous? Is there such a thing? Yeah, well, well one that won't do your brother or sister any harm. Right. Well, think of it like the jealousy is the, the desire to possess somebody for yourself. That sounds kind of selfish, right? You know, who, who can possess somebody? Well, when you make a vow to your spouse in marriage, you never get married to a person expecting that person to have affairs, right? You don't say, um, uh, I'm going to marry you and love you, and if you want to fool around, that's okay. No, the, the, there's, never, there's never been a marriage vow like that. Marriage is based on the, on the understanding that two people are pledging their fidelity to one another. And so you have every right to believe that your spouse is exclusively yours and that you don't share your spouse with anybody. And you have the right to be jealous if your spouse were to have an affair. This, my spouse is my, she belongs to me. And how dare somebody try to take her from me? So in essence, when he says, are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Because if the Christian church is the bride of Christ, Jesus is the bridegroom, has the righteous jealousy to expect his bride to be exclusively loving him. And to be loving and worshiping demons is really a type of spiritual adultery, which is, that's what idolatry is. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. Whenever you worship something other than God, you're committing spiritual adultery. Ten commandments say, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's right, and so that's what idolatry is, having another god before God, right? And that happens in all kinds of subtle ways. I mean, we may not bow down to a piece of stone, but people, um, whatever, uh, one way of describing it is whatever you love, honor, and fear above all else, right? So if you love, honor, or fear something, to, be, to have fear is like, you, you know, an awe or respect or you bow down to it. Some above God, if you do, you know, that could be people, it could be money, you know, it can be uh, fame, it could be desire, it could be lust, it could be, you know, even your own children, it could be, um, you know, your status, your, your, you know, pe people's reputations, you know, oh, I have to have this sterling um, uh, reputation. And so anything can become an idol. And God calls us to abandon all things. Uh, and, and allow him to be first in our life. And because God is a loving and good God, his kind of jealous love for us is not keeping us from anything else. He, he shares everything about him with us. So to love God alone, as it says in Matthew 6, 31-33, Jesus said, um, Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, uh, food and clothing and shelter and love, companionship, Everything you want in life, everything you need in life, God knows you need them. If you put God first, everything will be added to you. So when you worship God first, you get everything else. If you pursue anything else before God, then you lose God and everything else. You get everything else in a healthy way. That's right, in the way that God intended for it to not be a, to be a gift and not a God. Because right. if you worship things as a God, then you lose everything. And it, it becomes very unhealthy for you. 
Actually, yeah. the rich young ruler, uh, Jesus said to him, right. uh, you know, uh, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come with me. And I, that just scares the heck out of me when I think of that because he couldn't do it. Yeah. He couldn't do it. He sat there and looked at the Lord, the Son of Man, the Son of God, and said, I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it actually didn't say anything. He just walked away sad uh, because he had great wealth. So, but, and so what is that one thing that we need to turn our backs on in order to follow Jesus? See, for some people it is their wealth, and for other people it may be their pride. For other people it may be their, um, uh, you know, their children. It could, be, it could be money. It could be, you know, it was all kinds of things. You know, pursuit of beauty, youth. Or some people who they have to be looking young, and they're always, you know, getting um, plastic surgery and stuff. So whatever that... Yeah, vibes right. Well, taking care of yourself is different than treating youth as an idol, uh-huh. right? The idol, idolatry of youth, the pursuit of youth. We live in a youth culture. See, compared to like Asian cultures where they show respect for the elderly, America shows disrespect for the elderly. In fact, what they've done is taken, the, t- they've torn down elders and raised up the youth as, absolute. A, as absolute good. So in it's, school, in, well, that's less- yeah, and it and it's it's it's, it's not, wrong and it's, it's sad. Not under, as a teacher, I know it's well, not underneath, you know, hidden and secret. It's right on the open. That that disrespect for uh, the thinking of the past, the the, the ideas of elders mm-hmm. of Christian faith, even I think, is now yeah. openly being taught in many places. Right. Uh, and not uh, covertly, not hidden. Yeah, and it's, it's really sad that it's becoming so uh, overt. Uh, and that's why Jesus talked about how the days will um, come where people's love will grow cold and there'll be persecution and there'll be all kinds of false prophets and people telling others what their itching ears want to hear. Mm-hmm. So. Well, where, when did the change come? For, uh, it's always been changing. It's like, yeah, time is like a river. You can't step marriage, in the same river twice. For this marriage thing, because now I see, well, I haven't been watching television, but I never watch it much anyway. I see uh, a lot of people talking about threesome. What is that? I mean, what is that? Well, that's just another step along the road uh, because, you know, if marriage is no longer between a man and a woman, but it can be between any two people, then what's to stop it between marriage becoming something between three people or more people, yeah. right? Or, so, you know, even, I, I've even heard of people supposedly trying to marry their their pet. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Well, and there are law cases, I believe, going through the courts as we speak mm. uh, to challenge any restrictions against polygamy, any restrictions against even oh. like two men and one woman being a marriage and so on and so forth. All kinds of stuff. So, so you know, this, that's, um, that's when, uh, you know, uh, when sin, got, you know, it says in Romans chapter 1 that, that God gives people over to their sin. When they embrace sin, he'll give them over to the, their sinful lusts and their desires and, and we'll experience the, um, the, the punishment in our own bodies from our sin. So, and that's seen in the fact that you know, people who live um, uh, lives where they're very promiscuous sexually, um, that they have the highest rate of, um, of uh, trans, sexually transmitted diseases that cause infertility and sometimes even death. And as a result, you know, they, they're the ones who are they're, um, being disciplined by, by God by allowing their sin to get the best of them. I mean, the consequences of their actions are felt. You know, and you don't even have to put God in the picture. All you have to do is say, people who sleep around get uh, diseases that can make you infertile or kill you. And, you don't have, and, and you, it's no one's fault but the people who are doing it. You know, the only safe sex is, is uh, two committed people who are faithful to each other exclusively for their whole, their whole lives. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. So, um, so can they take, can they take, if they live in that way, can they take communion? And you, and you know as a pastor that that's the type of lifestyle that they're Okay, well, about. that's another question. You know, whether or not a person, okay, because communion, it, well, actually he's going to get into that in chapter 11. He oh. talks about communion should be for people who, um, who are able to examine themselves. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when a, a church says, in order for a person to receive communion, you need to recognize you are a sinner and that you need forgiveness. So, and from that point, you know, who's to decide whether or not a person's really sorry? You know, I, I guess 
their public lifestyle might be an example of that. So I think that's something that uh, needs to be taken on a case-by-case basis. I mean, there's a difference between like, you know, let's say a man, uh, d- d- um, he l- d- leaves his wife and he's living with his girlfriend in an open, adult, adulterous relationship. And he's coming to the communion altar with his wife who's estranged from him. I'm thinking, no, that person can't, is, is ineligible for communion. But uh, Ma- Matthew t- uh, 18 tells us, you go to that person, you confront them, and you, ask t- c- you call their sin out and it, one-on-one. That'd be like the wife telling her husband, you, ha- you have to break this relationship off and reconcile with me. Mm-hmm. And then if she says, no, I don't love you anymore, I want to live with my girlfriend, then you bring another person, and that person says, what you're doing is a sin in God's eyes, and you need to repent and move back with your wife and go to counseling. And he says, no, I'm going to live with my girlfriend. And then you bring the church in, and then the church says, are you, going to, you can't do this. And then they, he says, no, I'm going to still do it. Then, then they say, then you excommunicate that person, and you tell them they can no longer take communion. You, you cast them out of the, of the fellowship. That doesn't mean they can't come to public worship. That just means they can't come to the altar. And so those are the steps that you're supposed to take biblically in order to do that. Mm-hmm. Normally, um, you know, I don't have... Those three steps don't actually haven't occurred very often. So when people come to the altar, a lot of times I I'll, we have a statement of what we believe about communion, so people can come to communion after they've read it. And really, it's between them and God because I don't treat communion as if I'm the policeman to the altar. Like it's not my job to investigate people's lives to see if they're worthy. Because the fact is, nobody is worthy to take communion, and that's the only thing that actually makes you worthy to take it is because you recognize you're a sinner. If you are sorry for your sin and you want forgiveness, then the, the altar is the place to go. But there's obviously some other issues involved with that, and we'll talk about that probably next week. But um, in the end of verse, you can see how he's leading into this discussion. Right. These very things you you point out several times. We're going to see him talk about that. Talk to just as we get led in to talk about these things, he, the Apostle Paul, yeah. got led in to talk about these things 2,000 years ago. That's right. Yeah, you know, he talked about the issues with you know, going to um, uh, idol worship in pagan, um, pagan temples. And, and then he talked about the, the Lord's jealousy because God has every right to expect his bride to love him exclusively. And then he says, you know, are we to arouse the Lord's jealousy? And then he says, are we stronger than he? You know, that means he's talking about are we stronger than God? Do we have the right to tell God what to do? Because in, you know, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, in essence, told God what to do. You know, who do you think you are keeping the, the tree of life from us? And they ate from the tree, even though God said not to. They chose to believe that they knew better than God. So in essence, they were acting like they were stronger than he. And, that's, and so that's the warning here that Paul says for you and for me. Uh, okay, well, the next section is in verse 23. I don't Maybe we should uh, stop here. Well, I think we had a good discussion today. Mm-hmm. Thank you yeah. very much for yeah. leading us in that. Yeah. My phone has been acting up, so I can't actually I can't actually turn it off unless I plug it in. Can't turn it off unless you plug it in.